Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, Ali and Paws. <laughs> For this video, we'll be talking about autism. Since it's Autism Awareness Month, I figured I would do a series of videos that kind of just opens up the world of autism for people who don't know anything about autism. The first video I thought would be nice if it was an introduction video that kind of just goes over what autism is and like the most common questions about autism, things that you might have heard about autism that you don't really know what it means. So we're going over the 10 most common questions about autism is what I'm calling it. So share this video if you like it and subscribe please and like it to help people learn about autism this fine April. So for our first question we have what is autism? According to the CDC, autism is a developmental disability. It's also known as ASD, which is Autism Spectrum Disorder, and it basically means that your brain operates differently than others. So question number two, are you born with autism and is it genetic? So this question is actually a yes for the born with autism and then a yes and no for the is it genetic. So basically what that means is that autism can be genetic in a way because you will be more likely to have autistic children if you are autistic, but it doesn't mean that if your child is autistic, you're automatically autistic. But a lot of people actually do find out that they are autistic when their child gets diagnosed and then the person that diagnosed their child is like, hey, you're also exhibiting a lot of traits or they might connect the dots just based off of what the person says about their child. If they're saying like, oh, you know, your child is really struggling with so-and-so and the parent might think, oh, well, that's normal. I've struggled with so-and-so my whole life. And then they learn that, hey, that's actually autism. Question number three, can autism be cured or go away? Um, the answer to that is no. <laughs> Like I said, autism is a developmental disorder and it is something that you are born with and it is not going anywhere. Just because you're diagnosed late in life or early in life, it doesn't really matter. It's still autism. <laughs> you can be diagnosed at 70 as autistic and you were still autistic before you were diagnosed. You just weren't diagnosed. And the same thing goes for when you're diagnosed as a child. If you were diagnosed autistic at like 10, you're still autistic when you're like 50. And this is actually a problem that I see a lot as far as like getting resources and accommodations and things like that goes. People tend to forget that autistic children grow into autistic adults and autistic adults need accommodations the same way the children needed accommodations. And accommodations don't make you less than and it shouldn't make employers want to hire you less, but it does and it's really unfortunate. But yeah, it cannot be cured or go away. And I think it's really important to know that I'm not going to say every autistic person doesn't want their autism to go away, but I would say most autistic people just want accommodations and they want the world to be more accessible and kind for their autism. Because at the end of the day, if you take away our autism, you're taking away like pretty much who we are. And that's why you'll see so many autistic people say, don't use things like people with autism, use autistic person because autism is thoroughly wired in our brain. Every information that we take in is gonna be through an autistic lens. Question number four, how is autism diagnosed? Autism is diagnosed through basically like a series of tests. If you're a child, those tests can be a lot more, I don't wanna say physical in nature because that seems like I'm talking about the gym, uh, but it's like more things that they are doing with their hands and the person is watching them. Like they might look at how they play or I've never been <laughs> diagnosed as a child. I was diagnosed as an adult. So it's not like I've been through any of that testing. I don't particularly know what all goes into it. I've just seen like videos of it here and there. When you're older, autism is typically diagnosed through a series of like tests that kind of measure different things, I suppose you could say. They're usually questions pertaining to your life, especially your past. Oftentimes it involves interviewing your parents or parent or guardian, whoever brought you up. <laughs> it involves interviewing them because you're born with autism. So those signs will be there in childhood. And sometimes parents just don't know what they're looking at. They might think their child is just shy or their child is just reserved, but it's a little bit different than that, right? I think it's important to understand that everyone struggles with autism are so vastly different. You definitely cannot look at one autistic person's presentation of autism and then try and copy paste it onto every other autistic person's personality and way of living and way of being because it just will never be correct. But um, yeah, so it can be a variety of presentations. And so it's definitely important to remember that a wide variety exists. So basically like those things that they have the children do they basically will ask a lot of that of your parents to see how much of it you did. 
as a child. So question number five for autism, is early diagnosis important? My answer to that would be yes. I believe that early diagnosis is probably the best thing you can do for your child. I know a lot of people will start to think of things as like these labels that can never go away. And it's just not like, it's just not a healthy way of looking at it. No one has access to your medical records but you. If you don't want to tell people you have autism, you very much do not have to. But the reason why I feel like early diagnosis is so important is because when you have an early diagnosis, those accommodations and things are there for you much earlier. And for me personally, I know if I had had accommodations as a kid, I would have had a much easier time in school. You guys know I have anxiety. I made a video about shopping with autism and I talk a lot about anxiety in that video as well, which you can watch right here. A lot of the times anxiety can develop with autism because you're trying so hard to be something you're not, fit in where you don't, and it can be hard. I have an anxiety disorder, likely developed from having undiagnosed autism, which was not accommodated, and I was made to feel like I needed to fit in and be something I'm not, and follow these random rules of society that don't make sense to me, but... <laughs> But yes, early diagnosis is important. Question number six, why do adults, especially women, seek diagnosis later in life? So the reason why autistic adults will seek a diagnosis is usually just for answers. And also of course, like accommodations. If you're going to university and you're having something that's really, really bothering you or you're working and you're having something that's really, really bothering you, a lot of times to get accommodations to have that thing stop bothering you so much to where you can't work or do your work is through having a diagnosis and then your doctor can write a letter for you basically saying this is what you have, this is what you struggle with, this is why you struggle with it, or whatever is medically allowed to go into that note because I don't <laughs> I don't really remember, but I know there's like laws around like what they can and can't ask you. So whatever is medically allowed to go in that note, whatever you feel like you yourself want to reveal can go into that note and get you the accommodations that you need. And that's a lot of times reasons why people end up seeking a diagnosis. With that being said though, there's a lot of people that seek a diagnosis just for like I said before, just answers just because they're like I've been struggling with this thing my whole life and I've always felt different and they're like I want some answers or their kid has been diagnosed and they're like you know what I actually struggle with the same things that they're saying my kid struggles with so I like some answers so that's definitely something that people will go and get a diagnosis for but yeah I would say those are the main reasons and I would also like to note too that autistic women oftentimes go undiagnosed and it is because of the way society treats women basically like we have a lot of expectation to fall in line whereas men can kind of go out of line and this gives them the freedom to well be free <laughs> enough that people notice that they're different and with women it's a lot of times not like that question number seven is everyone a little autistic no no they're not no no you either are or you aren't like I said, it's a developmental disability. You are born with autism, so you don't randomly develop it <laughs> and you don't randomly get rid of it. There is no, oh, my kid's shy, so she must be autistic. Oh, my kid's reserved, so they must be autistic. Oh, they like trains, so they must be autistic. Like, there is no one thing that you can look at someone and be like, oh, they must be autistic then, or they must be a little bit autistic. No. <laughs> You either are or you aren't. Like I said before, if you're autistic, you're gonna look at everything through your autistic lens because it's about your brain, right? With the way your brain operates, <laughs> like you cannot change the way your brain operates. So there is no little bit of operation this way and a little bit of operation that way. Like it just operates the way that it operates <laughs> and you, you don't get to pick you know, you're just born with it and that's it. I hope that makes sense. Like obviously I'm not a medical professional. I'm just an individual with autism. Question number eight. Why do autistic people struggle with sensory issues and social skills? Like I said before, autistic people's brains work differently. That means, again, we will absorb information and take in information differently. So when it comes to sensory things and social skills. Something that's not a very big deal to someone sensory wise might be a big deal to someone who's autistic sensory wise. For instance, you obviously wouldn't want to wear a shirt made of bricks, right? <laughs> you know, and certain textures can feel like there are a bunch of bricks on your skin. 
You obviously don't want a bunch of slime covering your hands 24 seven. And certain textures can feel like for an autistic person that they have like slime covering their hands when they're touching it. And so everyone's just very different with what they struggle with and what they don't struggle with. Social skills are something that autistic people tend to struggle with a lot. Very much so because the world is not made with autistic people in mind. Just something as simple as smiling at someone. Probably something that people do with zero thought in their head. I have to have like four or five different rules around it to do it right. <laughs> And even then sometimes I feel like I don't do it right. <laughs> sometimes I feel like I smile too soon or I smile too late <laughs> or I smile too big or I smile so small that they couldn't see the smile so they probably don't even think I smiled at them. Definitely anxiety is coming into that because when you don't know that you're autistic you will oftentimes bend to these rules that just don't mesh well with you and aren't really needed or necessary. Like they're not gonna throw you in jail if you don't smile at someone. So when you know you're autistic, you can make the choice to be like, you know what? I'm not gonna smile at everybody because I don't want to go over six different rules in my head <laughs> about smiling at everybody every time someone smiles at me or that I think someone might smile at me. So I'm gonna make the choice to just not partake in that social ritual that people do and I'm gonna be better off for it. But this goes back to why I say an early diagnosis is so important because once you don't think that way, like obviously childhood shapes you a lot <laughs> into the person that you grow into. And if you're somebody that consistently was bending in childhood, it's gonna be really difficult to break that cycle of consistently bending to society's rules and expectations. And that is where masking comes in. Which leads us to question number nine, which is what is stimming and what is masking? So when you are forcing yourself to do something that you wouldn't normally do or that you wouldn't care to do, if the expectations weren't there, then that is what masking is. Going back to the smile example again, because I feel like that's the easiest example. I wouldn't smile at people if the expectation wasn't there. <laughs> if it wasn't like that I'm expected to smile or that I'm expected to smile back, I wouldn't smile at people. I just wouldn't. But because society tells us that, hey, if you don't smile at this person, you have an attitude or you're having a bad day, you don't remember them or you don't like them or whatever. <laughs> Instead of, I just don't feel like fixing my face into a smile right now for literally no reason. I hate to say this in a way that I feel like it sounds a little bit mean, but you're not happy to see an associate. <laughs> like, it's not something that you're like, oh my God, associate person, you know? Um, and you're definitely not happy to see a stranger. Like, it's just neutral. So it's frustrating, at least for me, to have to hype myself up to give a smile to somebody that honestly I don't know that doesn't care about me. I don't care about them probably. And if they're associate and we do care about each other mildly, it's not in a way that's big enough for me to be like offering them this like <laughs> gigawatt smile. Obviously when I say hi to my friends, I smile because I'm happy to see them. That's what a smile is to me. It's happiness. That's how I understand smiles. But like I said, society has put all these rules and expectations on when you smile and what for. And it's just a little bit ridiculous. It's, a, it's the same as like when you go to a job interview and you're expected to smile and shake hands. Like, for what? <laughs> what about me smiling and shaking your hand makes me more able to do this job than I was if I didn't do those things? Like say if the job is like painting, you're not gonna be a better painter because you shook the person's hand. I just, I don't get it. But <laughs> But again, autistic. So what's stimming? Stimming is basically something that autistic people tend to do unconsciously. And it's basically something that happens either when we're feeling anxious or nervous or happy. Stimming can also be something that's just like calming for autistic people and things like that. My stimming is very much unconscious. Everything that I do stimming wise is unconscious. For others, that might not be the case, but for me it definitely is. So I can't really give you a ton of examples of like what I do. I just know I do movement ones and I know I do vocal ones. Question number 10, is autism a disability? And the answer to this is yes, but it's not always disabling. Basically what that means is like, if you have accommodation in place that you need or you take adequate time to yourself to rest. You might not be disabled by your autism, right? It might not be disabling for you. For others, those things aren't enough. Accommodations, no matter how many they get, it just will never be enough because the world's just really not made with autistic people in mind. A great example is, I think a lot of people know about autistic people struggle with light and things like that. I'm somebody that struggles with light a lot. 
<laughs> the only time that my lights are on and my window is open is when I'm filming these videos. <laughs> this is very rare. I do not have my window open unless it's like raining because I like to look at the rain. The rain's nice. If I was to film this video the way my room normally looks, you would not be able to see me and you definitely wouldn't be able to see Kat. He's back there knocked out. Oh my god, he's so cute. Look, adorable. And that's just because like I said, you know, I'm somebody that struggles a lot with light. Light drains me. <laughs> I would love to film videos and then instantly go and edit them and post them like all in the same day. But once I film a video, I literally cannot edit it the same day <laughs> because the light I have to put on to be visible <laughs> in a camera is so draining. <laughs> so for me, my ideal world would be a place that has light, but it's it's dim. Like it's just enough so you can see, and that's all I need. <laughs> like I don't need bright lights everywhere. You know, if, for me, if I go to a supermarket. I would love if the lights were just dim all the time. And if I needed like a brighter light, I could just pull out my phone and use that because I wouldn't need it most of the time. <laughs> so like that would be the ideal situation for me if everywhere that I went was just dim lights. <laughs> but that's not the world we live in. And so that's why I say that accommodations can't always be enough because I mean, you can't expect <laughs> to go into a hospital and the hospital have dim lights. Like they need to see what they're doing. They're doing like surgery and stuff. And I'm sure there's some reason that grocery stores need bright lights as well sometimes. Maybe they need to be able to see if something has like mold on it. And by the way, when I say bright lights, I just mean not dim lights, not like actual super bright lights. <laughs> they're all super bright to me. It's just why I keep calling them bright lights. <laughs> but I just mean a normal light. And for most people, it's not an issue, right? But for some autistic people, it can be. And this is why you'll see this as an example a lot. When people talk about autism and the struggles of autism, you'll hear light, things like light and socializing a lot because it's just the easiest ones to explain. Like for instance, it doesn't matter that I have the accommodation of a service animal, like you baby back there. <laughs> that accommodation doesn't matter when it comes to lights because the lights are still on. And no matter what he does, like they're not gonna turn off. <laughs> like they're not gonna be less bright to me. I can have him do DPT if it starts to get overwhelming and that's why it's great to have a service animal to help mitigate those disabilities. But I think it's, like I said, you know, it's not like it's just gonna go away though. You know, I'm gonna always have this thing with lights. So that is why it's disabling for some people. For some autistic people, they can deal with the light and then they go home and they take a nap and it's fine. Or they go home at night and it's, it's fine. Or they don't even have problems with lights. Every autistic person is different. So I think that's extremely important to know. But I think that's all I have for you guys for this video. I hope this was interesting and I hope that you learned something and I hope that you like and subscribe and stick around to see the rest of the autism content for this month. I won't only be doing autism content for just this month only, but I'll like continue to do it in the future. But I also am gonna do other videos. <laughs> so anyways, happy autism awareness month you guys um, and I hope you like the video and subscribe and stick around please and we'll see you soon bye <laughs>